an object of love by mary e wilkins there were no clouds in the whole sky except a few bleak violet colored ones in the west between them the sky showed a clear cold yellow the air was very still and the trees stood out distinctly there's going to be a heavy frost sure enough said ann millet i have to get the squashes in she stood in the door surveying the look outside as she said this then she went in and presently emerged with a little black shawl pinned closely over her head and began work this was a tiny white painted house with a door and one window in front and a little piazza over which the roof jutted and on which the kitchen door opened on the rear corner the squashes were piled up on this piazza in a great yellow and green heap a splendid lot they are said anne i'd ought to be thankful anne always spoke of her obligations to duty and never seemed to think of herself as performing the duty itself i'd ought to be thankful said she always her shawl pinned closely over her hair and ears showed the small oval of her face the greater part of it seemed to be taken up by a heavy forehead from under which her deep-set blue eyes looked with a strange solemn expression she looked alike at everything the clear cold sky and the squashes soberly and solemnly this expression taken in connection with her little delicate old face had something almost uncanny about it some people complained of feeling nervous when anne looked at them that's miss stone coming said she hope to goodness she won't stop and hinder me lord's sake i ought to have more patience a tall stooping figure came up the street and paused at her gate hesitatingly good evening anne good evening miss stone come in won't you mrs stone came through the gate walked up to the piazza and stopped getting in your squashes ain't you yes i didn't dare risk em out to-night it's so cold i left em out last year and they got touched and it about spoiled em well i should be kind of afraid to risk em it's a good deal colder than i had any idea of when i come out i thought i'd run over to miss maxwell's a minute so i just clapped on this head tie and this little cape over my shoulders and i'm chilled clean through i don't know but i've took cold yes i'd take em in we got ourn in last week such as they was we ain't got more than half as many as you have i shouldn't think you could use em all anne well i do i allers like squash and and willie likes em too you ought to see him brush round me around and up his back and a purrin when i'm a scraping em out of the shell he likes em better than fresh meat seems queer for a cat to like such things Arn won't touch him he's awful dainty how nice and big your cat looks a settin there in the winder he's watchin of me he jumped up there just the minute i come out he's a good deal of company for you ain't he yes he is what on earth i should do this long winter that's comin without him i don't know everybody wants something that's alive in the house that's so must be pretty lonesome for you anyway ruth and me often speak of it when we look over here especially in the winter season some of them awful stormy nights we have well i don't mean to complain anyway or to be thankful i got my bible and willie and a roof over my head and enough to eat and wear and a good many folks have to be alone as far as other folks is concerned on this earth and perhaps some other woman ain't lonesome because i am maybe she'd be one of the kind that didn't like cats and wouldn't have got along half as well as me no i got a good many mercies to be thankful for more than i deserve i never ought to complain well if all of us looked at our mercies more in our trials we'd be a good deal happier but sakes i must be going i'm catching cold and i'm hindering you it's supper time too you've got something cooking in the house that smells good yes it's some stewed tomato i allers like something i can eat butter and pepper on such a night as this well something of that kind is good good night ann 
Good night, Miss Stone. Going to meeting tonight? I'm going if Ruth don't. One of us has to stay with the children, you know. Good night. Mrs. Stone had spoken in a very high-pitched tone all the while, and was somewhat deaf. She had spoken loudly and shrilly, too, so now there was a sudden lull, and one could hear a cricket chirping somewhere about the door. Mrs. Stone, pulling her tiny drab cape tighter across her stooping rounded shoulders, hitched rapidly down the street to her own home, which stood on the opposite side, a little below Anne's, and Anne went on tugging in her squashes. I'm glad she's gone, she muttered, looking after Mrs. Stone's retreating figure. I didn't know how to be hindered a minute. I ought to have more patience. She had to carry in the squashes one at a time. She was a little woman, and although she had been used to hard work all her life, it had not been of a kind to strengthen her muscles. She had been a dressmaker. So she stepped patiently into the kitchen with a squash, and out without one, then in again with one. She piled them up in a heap on the floor in a corner. "'They'll have to go up on that shelf over the mantel,' said she. "'Tomorrow. I can't get them up there tonight and go to meetin' no how. She had a double shelf of unpainted pine rigged over the ordinary one for her squashes. After the squashes were all in, Anne took off her shawl and hung it on a nail behind the kitchen door. Then she set her bowl of smoking hot tomato stew on a little table between the windows and sat down contentedly. There was a white cloth on the table and some bread and butter and pie beside the stew. Anne looked at it solemnly. I'd order be thankful. That was her way of saying grace. Then she fell to eating with a relish. This solemn, spiritual-looking old woman loved her food and had a keen lookout for it. Perhaps she got a spiritual enjoyment out of it, too, besides the lower material one. Perhaps hot stewed tomatoes, made savory with butter and pepper and salt on a frosty November night, had for her a subtle flavor of home comfort and shelter and coziness, appealing to her imagination besides the commoner one appealing to her palate. Before anything else, though, before seating herself, she had given her cat his saucer of warm milk in a snug corner by the stove. He was a beautiful little animal, with a handsome dark striped coat on his back and white paws and face. When he had finished lapping his milk, he came and stood beside his mistress's chair while she ate and purred, he rarely mewed, and she gave him bits of bread from her plate now and then. She talked to him, too. Nice, Willie, said she. Nice, cat. Got up on the window to see me bring in the squashes, didn't he? There's a beautiful lot of em, and he shall have some stewed for his dinner tomorrow, so he shall. And the cat would purr and rub his soft coat against her and look as if he knew just what she meant. There was a prayer meeting in the church vestry that evening, and Anne Millet went. She never missed one. The minister, when he entered, always found her sitting there at the head of the third seat from the front, in the right-hand row, always in the same place, a meek, erect little figure in a poor, tidy black bonnet and an obsolete black coat, with no seam in the whole of the voluminous back. That had been the style of outside garments when Miss Millet had laid aside dressmaking, and she had never gone a step further in fashions. She had stopped just where she was, and treated her old patterns as conservatively as she did her Bible. She had had a pretty voice when she was young, people said, and she sang now in a thin, sweet quaver the hymns which the minister gave out. She listened in solemn enjoyment to the stereotyped prayers and the speaker's remarks. He was a dull, middle-aged preacher in a dull country town. After meeting, Anne went up and told him how much she had enjoyed his remarks and inquired after his wife and children. She always did. To her, a minister was an unpublished apostle, and his wife and family were set apart on the earth. No matter how dull a parson labored here, he would always have one disciple in this old woman. 
when anne had walked home through the frosty starlight she lit her lamp first and then she called her cat she had expected to find him waiting to be let in but he was not she stood out on the little piazza which ran along the rear corner of her house by the kitchen door and called willie 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 she thought every minute she would see him come bounding around the corner but she did not she called over and over and over in her shrill anxious pipe willie 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 kitty 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 finally she went into the house and waited a while crouching shivering with cold and nervousness over the kitchen stove then she went outside and called again willie 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 over and over waiting between the calls trembling her dull old ears alert her dim old eyes strained she ran out to the road and looked and called and down to the dreary garden patch behind the house among the withered corn stalks and the mouldering squash vines all white with frost once her heart leaped she thought she saw willie coming but it was only a black cat which belonged to one of the neighbors then she went into the house and waited a little while then out again calling shrilly willie willie there were northern lights streaking the sky the stars shone steadily through the rosy glow and it was very still and lonesome and cold the little thin shivering old woman standing outdoors all alone in the rude chilly night air under these splendid stars and streaming lights called over and over the poor little creature which was everything earthly that she had to keep her company in the great universe in which she herself was so small willie 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 called anne oh where is that cat oh dear willie willie she spent the night that way mrs stone's daughter ruth who was up with the sick child heard her Miss Millet must have lost her cat, she told her mother in the morning. I heard her calling him all night long. Pretty soon, indeed, Anne came over, her small old face wild and wan. Have you seen anything of Willie? she asked. He's been out all night, and I'm afraid something's happened to him. I never knowed him to stay out so before. When they told her they had not, she went on to the next neighbors to inquire but no one had seen anything of the cat all that day and night at intervals people heard her plaintive inquiring call willie 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 the next sunday anne was not out at church it was a beautiful day too i'm going to run over and see if anne millet's sick mrs stone told her daughter when she returned from church she wasn't out to meetin' today, and I'm afraid something's the matter. I never knew her to miss goin'. So she went over. Miss Millet was sitting in her little wooden rocking chair in her kitchen when she opened the door. Why, Anne Millet, are you sick? No, I ain't sick. You wasn't out to meetin', and I didn't know. I ain't never going to meetin' again. Why, what do you mean? Mrs. Stone dropped into a chair and stared at her neighbor. I mean just what I say. I ain't never going to meetin' again. Folks go to meetin' to thank the Lord for blessings, I suppose. I've lost mine, and I ain't going. What have you lost, Anne? Ain't I lost, Willie? Really? You don't mean to say you're making such a fuss as this over a cat. Mrs. Stone could make a good deal of disapprobation and contempt manifest in her pale, high-featured face, and she did now. Yes, I do. Well, I ain't nothing again, cats, but I must say I'm beat. Why, Anne Millet, it's downright sinful of you to feel so. Of course you've said a good deal by Willie, but it ain't as if he was a human creature. Cats is cats. For my part, I never thought it was right to set by animals as if they was babies. I can't hear what you say. I never thought it was right to set by animals as if they was babies. I don't care. It's comforting to have live creatures about you, and I ain't never had anything like other women. 
I ain't had no folks of my own since I can remember. I worked hard all my life and had nothing at all to love and I thought I ought to be thankful all the same. But I did want as much as a cat. Well, as I said before, I've nothing again cats, but I don't understand any human being with an immortal soul a setting so much by one. I can't hear what you say. Anne could usually hear Mrs. Stone's high voice without difficulty, but today she seemed to defer. I don't understand any human being with an immortal soul a setting so much by a cat. You got folks, Miss Stone. I know I have, but folks is trials sometimes. Not that my children are, though. I've got a good deal to be thankful for, I'll own, in that way. But Anne Millet, I didn't think you was one to sink down so under any trial. I thought the Lord would be a comfort to you. I know all that, Miss Stone, but when it comes to it, I'm here, and I ain't there, and I've got hands, and I want something I can touch. Then the poor soul broke down and sobbed out loud like a baby. I ain't never felt as if I ought to begrudge other women in their homes and their folks. I thought perhaps I could get along better without them than some, and the Lord knowed it. And seeing there wasn't enough to go around, he gave him to them that needed him most. I ain't never felt as if I were to complain, but there was cats enough. I might have had that much. You could get another cat, Anne. Miss Maxwell's got some real smart kittens, and I know she wants to get rid of them. I don't want any of Miss Maxwell's kittens. I don't never want any other cat. Perhaps your own will come back. Now, don't take on so. What? Perhaps your own will come back. No, he won't. I'll never see him again. I felt just that way about it from the first. Somebody stole him, or he's been poisoned and crawled away and died, or he's been shot for his fur. I hear there was a boy over the river making a cat skin carriage blanket. <laughs> And I went over there and asked him. And he said he had never shot a cat like Willie. But I don't know. Boys ain't brought up any too strict. I hope he spoke the truth. Hark, I declare, I thought I heard a cat mew somewhere. But I guess I didn't. I don't hear it now. Well, I am sorry, Anne. I suppose I've got to go. That's dinner to get, and the baby considerably fretty today. Why, Ann Millet, where's your squashes? What? Where are your squashes? I throwed them away, out in the field. Well, he can't have none of them now, and I don't care about them myself. Mrs. Stone looked at her in horror. When she got home, she told her daughter that Ann Millet was in a dreadful state of mind, and she thought the minister ought to see her. She believed she should tell him if she were not out to meet him that night. She was not. This touch of grief had goaded that meek, reverential nature into fierceness. The childish earnestness which she had had in religion, she had now in the other direction. Ann Millet, in spite of all excuses that could be made for her, was for the time a wicked, rebellious old woman, and she was as truly so as if this petty occasion for it had been a graver one in other people's estimation. The next day the minister called on her, stimulated by Mrs. Stone's report. He did not find her so outspoken. Her awe of him restrained her. Still, this phase of her character was a revelation to him. He told his wife when he returned home that he never should have known it was Anne Millet. In the course of the call, a rap came at the kitchen door. Anne rose and answered it, hopping nervously across the floor. She returned to the minister with more distress in her face than ever. Nothing but a little gal with a malty cat, said she. The children have got wind of my losing Willie, and they mean it all right, but it seems as if I should fly. They keep coming and bringing cats. They'll find a cat that they think maybe is Willie, and 
so they bring him to show me they've brought malty and white cats and cats all malty they've brought yellow cats and black and there wasn't one of em looked any like willie then they've brought kittens that they knowed wasn't willie but they thought maybe i'd like em instead of him they mean all right i know they're real tender-hearted but it most kills me why they brought me two little kittens that hadn't got their eyes open just before you come they were striped and white and they said they thought they'd grow up to look like willie they were the hooper children and they knowed him it would have been ludicrous if the poor old woman's distress had not been so genuine however mr beale the minister was not a man to see the ridiculous side he could simply be puzzled and that he was it was a case entirely outside his experience and he did not know how to deal with it he wondered anxiously what he had best say to her finally he went away without saying much of anything for he was so afraid that what he said might be out of proportion to the demands of the case it seemed to him bordering on sacrilege to treat this trouble of ann millet's like a genuine affliction though on the other hand that treatment was what her state of mind seemed to require going out the door he stopped and listened a minute he thought he heard a cat mew then he concluded he was mistaken and went on he watched eagerly for ann the next meeting night but she did not come it is doubtful whether or not she ever would have done so if she had not found the cat she had a nature which could rally an enormous amount of strength for persistency but the day after the meeting she had occasion to go down cellar for something the cellar stairs led up to the front part of the house indeed the cellar was under that part only and went through her chilly sitting-room she never used it except in summer and opened the cellar door which was in the front entry there was a quick rush from the gloom below and willie flew up the cellar stairs lord's sake said ann with a white shocked face he has been down there all the while now i remember he followed me when i came through here to get my cloak that meeting night and he wanted to go down cellar and i let him i thought he wanted to hunt lord's sakes she went back into the kitchen her knees trembling the cat followed brushing against her and purring she poured out a saucer of milk and watched him hungrily lapping he did not look as if he had suffered though he had been in the cellar a week but mice were plenty in this old house and he had probably foraged successfully for himself anne watched him the white awed look still on her face i suppose he mewed and i didn't hear him there he was all the time just where i put him and me a blamin of the lord and puttin of it on him i've been an awful wicked woman i ain't been to meetin and i've talked and them squashes i threw away it's been so warm they ain't froze and i don't deserve it i hadn't ought to have one of em i hadn't ought to have anything i ought to offer up willie lord's sakes think of me saying what i did and him down cellar that afternoon mrs stone looked across from her sitting-room window where she was sewing and saw anne slowly and painfully bringing in squashes one at a time look here ruth she called to her daughter just you see ann millet's bringing in them squashes she threw away i don't believe but what she's come to her senses the next meeting night ann was in her place the minister saw her rejoicing after meeting he hurried out of his desk to speak to her she did not seem to be coming to see him as usual when she looked up at him there was an odd expression on her face her old cheeks were flushing i am rejoiced to see you out miss millet said the minister shaking her hand yes i thought i'd come out tonight. i am so happy to see you're feeling better the cat has come back said anne end of an object of love by mary e wilkins